Well, tonight we are in the 14th session of our review of the book of Revelation. And it's chapter 7 of the book of Revelation, which is, involves the sealing of a peculiar group called the 144,000. And uh, just to, by way of a little backup and review, since we have some new people here too, Revelation has its own outline. Verse 19 of the first chapter outlines the entire book for us. John is told to, by Jesus to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be metatauta hereafter. And that is a partitioning of the entire book. The first chapter was a vision of Jesus Christ that, that uh, John was treated to, and that was what he had seen. He says, write that down. And the things which are, and there are two chapters, chapters 2 and 3, which are seven letters to seven churches by none other than Jesus Christ himself. It's a report card to seven representative churches that portray real churches in those days, but also are a prophetic outline of all churches throughout history. The most important two chapters of the book are chapters 2 and 3. So if you're here for the first time or getting into that, don't worry about the rest of it. Master chapters 2 and 3. Find out all about that. And then, of course, from chapter 4 on, the things which shall be after the churches, hereafter, metatauta, that which follows after the churches. And that's the section, of course, we're in now with section 7, uh, chapter 7. But it's interesting uh, uh, that uh, when you get to chapter 4, it says, after this, John says, after this I looked, be and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Metatauta, after these things, or hereafter, same word in the Greek. It's a flag, it's a marker. This is now in the third session. We're now speaking something that's from the rapture for going forward. And we encounter, among other things, 24 elders. I'm not going to review all the different identities and things that we talked about, but this is so pivotal I wanted just to underscore this. These 24 elders that John sees, it's interesting if you compare the vision of the throne of God that Isaiah sees in Isaiah 6 or Daniel sees in Daniel chapter 7 with the one that John sees in the New Testament, they're very identical, very similar except for one thing. None of them in the Old Testament saw the 24 elders. And that's a clue as to their identity, by the way, because uh, uh, there's one thing that was hidden from the Old Testament, and that's the church. And it was Paul's privilege in Ephesians 3, he announces, to, to, uh, to express that. And that's what John is seeing here. The, these 24 elders represent a completed group. We know that from 1 Chronicles 24 and elsewhere. What we know they cannot be, there's a number of theories that you'll find in people's writing books, uh, 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 people's commentaries on these things. They're, ma they're making guesses, but we know they cannot be tribulation believers because they're contrasted with them in chapter 7, verse 13, which we'll see today. They're contrasted with angels. Angels and the 24 elders are all assembled, so they're distinct from angels. They're also distinct from the nation Israel. What are their characteristics that make them unique? They're on thrones. That makes them unique. They are in white raiment, which is a special symbolism, of course. And they are wearing crowns of gold. And it turns out that th these things are very distinctive identifiers. They also sing a song which identifies themselves beyond question. And we'll take a look at that. And they're called elders and kings and priests. The fact that they're kings and priests, there's only three groups that are kings and priests. Melchizedek, Jesus Christ, and believers in Christ. We also, uh, in Revelation 4, we f saw these seven lamps of fire burning before the throne. These lamps of fire were identified for us in chapter 1, where Jesus himself identifies them as the seven churches. So the churches that were on the earth in chapter 1 are in heaven in chapter 4. These are just a number of reasons why we uh, hold the view that uh, chapter 4 is, the, is identi identified with the rapture, and uh, you'll see other reasons why that all fits in a little bit here. From chapter 4, we go to chapter 5, and we have the high point of the whole book in many respects. The seven seals scroll emerges. And John says, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. The fact that it's written on the outside or backside identifies as a will or a title deed, a legal document. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. It had to be a kinsman of Adam. A kinsman issue is emerging here. And John, we don't know what's happening, but John does. And that's the clue here. John says, I, I wept much 
because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. Now, there's a, uh, w this is a point where we also took advantage of plunging into the book of Ruth, which is a wonderful little love story, a little four-chapter book that's an elegant love story and studied as a piece of literature in most colleges, independent of the Bible. And yet it's also a prophetic uh, model, if you will, of what is involved with a kinsman redeemer. You really you won't understand a goel or a kinsman redeemer unless you understand the book of Ruth, and that's a central prerequisite to understanding what's going on here in the book of Revelation. A goel had to be a kinsman. He must be able to perform the redemption. He had to be willing to perform the redemption, and he must assume all the obligations. That involved the redemption of land or the taking of a, a bride, a Leverite marriage. And Boaz in the story, Ruth, of course, is the Lord of the harvest and the kinsman redeemer. Naomi is a type of Israel. She's exiled from the land, but through his redemption she is returned to the land. And Ruth is the Gentile bride that he takes, all of this, of course, being incredibly predictive of God's plan of redemption. And so I commend you to, to study that if, if that's new to you. But then we get, notice something, something else I want you to notice from Revelation chapter 5 is that we, we notice from chapter, up to chapter 4 the titles, there are 24 titles of Jesus Christ in the first three chapters, but they're all Gentile type identifiers. Uh, uh, typically they're pr primarily uh, uh, church type identifiers. But from chapter 4 on, from the rapture on, I want you to be sensitive, sensitive to the Jewishness of the book. There's a very strange shift of style. And here we see it already in chapter 5, verses five, verse 5. One of the elders said unto me, and by the way, when the elders explained something to John, they're explaining something that's going on in heaven. When the living creatures, the cherubim, talk, they're explaining what's going on in the earth. So that's the linkage, by the way. One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. These are Jewish titles of who? Jesus Christ. Actually, of whom, I'm sorry. Okay. Have we able to open the book and loose the seals thereof? And I beheld, lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood the Lamb as, he, as it had been slain, having seven heads and seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, and so on. Um, again, we have. The Lamb is the title of Christ. It was the title that John the Baptist introduced him as in his first public appearance. Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Twice John the Baptist identified him that way. But I want you to notice these three titles, obviously of a Redeemer, but also in the Jewish or Messianic sense, if you will. So let's move on here. Uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, the, Jesus the King. The Lion, that was Jacob's first final blessing on his sons in Genesis 49. The Root of David. And he's the Root of David and also the Offspring of David. And so he confounded the Pharisees with that uh, apparently oxymoron or, or paradox. And he was the result of David's line, yet he was the one who brought David uh, and the line itself into existence. And so he con confounds the, the, the uh, in Matthew 22, he, con he confounds the uh, Pharisees with that uh, paradox. And, uh, and this whole issue, the root David was confirmed to Mary by Gabriel. And it's astonishing that most churches don't recognize the significance of that that Jesus Christ is committed to sit on the throne of David. That throne did not exist during his ministry. Anyway, he came up, Jesus came up, and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty, uh, twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. I want you to notice they have harps, not palms. You say, well, what's that got to do with anything? Stand by, you'll see. There's a subtlety that's coming downstream here. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation. Notice that these 24 elders are not Jewish, necessarily. They are out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. And hast made us to our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. That's the 24 elders. Us, us, we, they're identifying themselves by their song. And I want to caution you, there are uh, Bible helps around that say, puts this in the second person rather than the first person. In other words, them. And that's only one of 25 manuscripts has that translation. And that was a, that's a corrupt translation out of Alexandria. And so that's a, a, a non-starter. 
No, it's clear that the, the, this song they sing identify beyond question who they are. But that should even, that's even confirmed by the first chapter. You may recall that John says, Unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. John himself is identifying himself with that same identity. Well, the order of events, you know, you, will, you have by now studied the 70th week of Daniel. You understand the, the, the definition of that. The first half of that seven-year period is a false peace that's, uh, in which the covenant that's enforced by this world leader is violated, and uh, he sets himself up to be worshipped. And that launches a period that Jesus himself labels as the Great Tribulation, three and a half years. And that's the, def the definitive period for this is the 70th week of Daniel. Some people speak of a seven-year tribulation, that's sloppy definitions. The tribulation is a three and a half year second half of that period of time. Let's be precise if we're going to play this game. Armageddon, of course, is at the end of that. The rapture occurs sometime prior to that, and uh, the second coming interrupts the battle of Armageddon. And Revelation chapter 6 through 19 is actually an expansion or a detailing of these tremendous events that occur within that seven-year period, the so-called 70th week of Daniel. And that's important to understand. Um, chapter 1 was a vision of Christ, chapter 2 and 3 the churches, but they're now behind us. The harpazo, the rapture is taking place. And when you get to chapter 19, the fifth horseman of the apocalypse, the one riding a white horse that is Christ, not a pretender, uh, will come and, and that leads to the final few chapters which lead to the millennium and heaven and so forth. While we're in heaven during this 70th week, there's apparently the Bema Seat of Judgment and also the Marriage Supper of the Lamb, which precedes His return. When He did the Last Supper, when Jesus uh, administered the Last Supper, there are four cups that make up the Passover. With the third cup, He instituted the Lord's Supper. He never drank the fourth one. He, see, he took a Nazarite vow, in effect, that He would not touch the fruit of the vine until we're all together at that supper. And so that's going to be quite a, quite a supper. Dan Brown has a novel that purports that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. He's really mixed up. He's in for a big shock when he goes up before the judgment seat and discovers the guy in charge of the guy he's been libeling all these years. But uh, there, is, there is going to be a marriage supper, but it's something quite different than Dan Brown has any grasp of. And of course, at the second coming, we have the millennium, Satan being bound and all of that that we'll deal with when we get to chapter 20. The Great Tribulation, very important for us to understand this. This, this, this term is defined by Jesus as He quotes from Daniel 12, where uh, it, uh, in Matthew 24, He quotes, For then shall be great tribulation, such was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. This is a tribulation that will make the Holocaust in Europe pale in this insignificance. The Holocaust in Germany, it took approximately one Jew and three in, on the planet Earth. According to Zephaniah chapter 13, verse 8 and 9, the next one is going to take two out of three. So it's going to be a time of trouble, a time of Jacob's trouble, very serious time. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And the purpose of the tribulation uh, is in part explained in Hosea, the last verse of chapter 5, where God says, I will go and return to my place. Strange word for God to use. In order for God to return, He must have left it. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction they will seek me earnestly. And that's part of what's going on here. The nation Israel is going to be confronted, and when they petition His second coming, that's when He comes back, and they will. Now, the, the, understand some sequence of events here. Many people get confused about it. The tribulation doesn't begin until the Lamb opens the first seal of the seven-sealed book. That starts the the, the time of wrath, the time of tribulation. So far, so good. The Lamb doesn't receive the scroll to open until after the 24 elders place their crowns in the glassy sea. That point's made in chapter 4. The 24 elders and the seven lampstands are in heaven when the tribulation begins. In other words, there's a, there's a handful of not just inferences, pretty strong proofs of the identity that the, uh, the, uh, the church will not go through the tribulation. Anyone that thinks the church goes through the tribulation has two problems. He needs to understand the mystical nature of what the Greek ecclesia really is, the, 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 the mystery of the church. And the second thing, he has to, they have to understand what the purpose of the tribulation is. They're mutually exclusive for lots of reasons. 
But anyway, the tribulation begins, and we know it's God's wrath. To Revelation 6, that great day of the wrath of the Lamb is come, and who will be able to stand? In fact, that question, who will be able to stand, is answered by chapter 7 that we're going to get into. In the days of the, in the, days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. In Revelation chapter 11, thy wrath is come. Revelation 15, the seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. The climactic, the climactic pouring out of the wrath are the seven bowls that will come to after the seven trumpets. And then on it goes, chapter 16 and so forth. And finally, in chapter 16, it is done. It is finished. The other expression that you hear bandied about a lot, we need to understand, is the term the day of the Lord. It occurs 30 times in eight Old Testament books. And it occurs three times in the New Testament. It is the period we're talking about here. It's the day of God, 2 Peter 3. The day of wrath, Zephaniah 1. The day of the Lord's wrath, Zephaniah 1. The day of darkness in Joel 2 and so forth. It's a common phrase in the Old and New Testament, but that's what we're talking about. And in chapter 1, when John opens the book and says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, that's misleading. There are many commentators that miss the point. They think that means Sunday. No way. That's the day of the Lord. He is transported forward in time to the day of the Lord that all this is about. It's got nothing to do with the day of the week, actually. The opening, then, of the seven-seal scroll of Pachypitus in chapter 6, and we notice that there's a heptatic structure to the entire book. We have a seven-seal scroll in chapter 6. We notice that in each of these groups of seven throughout the book, there are six, then a parenthesis. There's sort of a break where we take a break and talk about something else for a while, and then we go back to the seventh. We call that, uh, for lack of a better term, a parenthesis, if you will. When you get to the seventh one, it turns out to be seven trumpets. And uh, this, again, between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, there's another parenthesis. This time, it's quite a parenthesis. Chapters 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14 are inserted that are sort of summary chapters that take a topic and expand on it. Babylon in one case, and Israel in another, and so forth. Very interesting chapters. And then we get to the seven bowls. And even in the seven bowls, if you have to look carefully, it's just a verse or two, but there's a parenthesis between sixth and seventh. So once you understand architecture, it helps. You know, it's interesting when you study hermeneutics, that is the study of interpretation, most of our seminary materials are aimed after what you would call a Greek model. We think of prophecy as prediction and fulfillment. A prediction and fulfillment. That's the Greek mentality. The Hebrew mentality is different. It's Mishnaic, meaning prophecy is pattern. One of the things that the Hebrew writers are much more sensitive to is that God deals in patterns. The Hebrew calendar is their catechism. You really don't understand Jewishness until you really understand their calendar. The seven feasts of Moses, the three in the first month, and the three in the seventh month, and the, one, the strange one in between, and so on. And same thing here in the book of Revelation. Another aspect of its Jewishness, its pattern. The same pattern is imposed on the, on the scroll, the trumpets, and the bowls, and so forth. And so I commend that to you as you go to understand. Now, when we talk about the seven seal scroll, of course, the first four are famous because they're known as the four horsemen, these four horsemen. And uh, when we published a briefing package on this, a series of them, we did one on each of the four horsemen, and then we did it one on the fifth horseman. And I'm always, I'll never forget this. I was walking through the lobby or in the, the front office there, and somebody was calling in. Doesn't Chuck know there's four horsemen in the, in the apocalypse? And the person on the phone said, uh, yeah, but according to the house, we try to give you more for your money. And, uh, <laughs> and obviously was kidding, uh, because uh, the fifth horseman being the one in Revelation 19. And uh, we thought it would be, it'd be improper to have four horsemen without really taking the climactic horseman as part of the package. So we did. Anyway, the seven seal scroll, we talked, the first one was the, the white horse which is an imposter. It's not Jesus Christ. It's the false, it's, it's, it's obviously a false conqueror who is, uh, if it's Jesus Christ, he's traveling in bad company. <laughs> then come the wars, famine and inflation, and death. And uh, so, then we get to the martyrs um, as the fifth seal, and finally the global upheaval. And uh, we covered that last time, the, the six seals. But there again, now we're, now we're at the point where that, uh, well, first of all, when we went that far, we also noticed that that group of signs that we talked about in the Olivet Discourse, be it Matthew 24 or Luke 21, this had false Christs, wars, famines, death, martyrs, and global people. Same sequence, if you will. And it's, uh, uh, um, 
very, there's a parallelism between the Matthew account, the Luke account, and this series of events in the book of Revelation. But then as, you, as we finished up on the, in chapter 6 last time, it said, The kings of the earth, the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Now, I've, at the time, I think I mentioned this is very interesting because this has a parallel in the book of Joshua. And that's going to be your assignment for next time is to read, not just the reading assignment for next time, but include in that a review of the book of Joshua. And you'll, I want to call your attention to the parallels. Some of them are very subtle, some of them are quite astonishing, but collectively they make quite a case that there's an architectural similarity between the book of Joshua and the book of Revelation that I want you sensitive to. But the issue here is the wrath of the Lamb, clearly, and we're in chapter 6. I mention that because there are some very popular commentaries that um, uh, try to make the wrath later. The wrath of the Lamb is in chapter 6 and following. That's important to understand. Just, that's what the text says. But the question that it closes with is the great day of His wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? What's the answer to that question? That's what chapter 7 is all about. And that brings us to tonight's study. Who shall be able to stand? We're going to, the chapter 7 will naturally divide itself into two halves. The first eight verses deal with some servants being sealed, a very special group of 144,000. And, from, and they're from 12 tribes. And uh, then the sa they result in a lot of people getting saved. The, well, I'll call the, the, the sealed servants and the saved servants. The lat from, chapters, from chapter 7, verse 9 through 17. These are people who are saved out of the tribulation. There are many scholars that believe there will be more people saved during the tribulation than before. If you, that's just that's a, that's a speculation on the part of some scholars. But so we have these, we've had these six seals. Now we come to what I call the parenthesis. In this case, it's a one chapter parenthesis. And we're going to take a look at this. Chapter 7, verse 1. John says, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Now, I'm just going to glimpse ahead, so to speak. When you get to chapter 8, four angels come forward with four trumpet judgments, and it starts. So these, I believe those are the same four angels. What's saying here, hey you guys, hold it for a minute. We've got something you've got to do first before you start. That's sort of the spirit of this thing. After these things I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth nor on the sea. In other words, this is, it's sort of a freeze frame situation. Suddenly all action, everything stops until the following takes place, which is a, a sealing procedure. Now, a lot of people make a big thing of the four corners of the earth and four winds of the earth. And uh, there actually are four corners of the earth, but I'm not going to get into that discussion magnetically and the rest. Uh, I'll accept, I can accept this as a figure of speech that is our colloquial. Just as we speak of sunrise and sunset, you can speak of sunrise and sunset without having someone bring Copernicus into the discussion, right? So the same kind of a, same kind of a thing. And by the way, if somebody ever does bring that into discussion, I'm one of these nuts that believe that the universe may be geocentric. It may astonish you to discover that there are serious scholars that believe that Earth is, that the universe is geocentric. When they do the michelson morlin experiment, they, they don't get a zero sum. It's a very close but not zero sum. So that raises some issues, but let's get, stay with the subject tonight. In any case, John says, I saw another angel sending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice, to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. See, that's what these four angels are going to do when we get to the trumpets in chapter 8. There's going to be a lot of hurt going on. And in fact, the trumpets will be known as the judgment of the thirds, because it gets three times that bad when you get to the bowls. Same pattern, more or less. We'll see when we get there. In any case, this, this, um, um, uh, this, there's a freeze frame thing going on here, as I might express it. And this fourth angel, this fifth angel says, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, until, apparently they will later, 
until we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. You know, this means a lot to me because I can remember as an impressionable teenager and I was reading the Bible studies, I ran into a commentary that tried to say that, well, grass is really people and this is really that and all kinds of conjectural symbolism that was unjustified from Scripture. And uh, uh, there are still people that take the book of Revelation especially and, and impute all kinds of fanciful conjectures into it. And it's easy to do in many respects. But it's interesting here, what this says, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees until they have sealed. This implies that when we're talking the earth, the sea and the trees, we're talking about the earth, the sea and the trees. I might mention I have gone through 50 years of study. I have a, a very self, I'm a very self-indulgent guy when it comes to library things. I've collected books. I have probably, I don't know, four or five, six thousand volume library. Um, and I've gone through a lot of uh, viewpoints. But I have to tell you that uh, as I progressed over these 50 years, as I, I've gone back to revise my previous views on certain things, it's always been in the direction of taking it even more literally than before. Doesn't mean I'm right, but just so you know where I'm coming from. And John says, I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So there's 144,000. Now, I don't know how many of you have had someone ring, their door, ring your doorbell with a long tie and a bicycle and whatever, and say that, uh, usually in pairs, and, uh, and try to explain that they're one of the 144,000. Well, there's two problems with that. The first one, if when, they st when they tell you that, ask what tribe they're from, and they won't have a, a meaningful answer. The other thing you might call to their attention is that when there is a convention of the Jehovah's Witnesses, they have usually a quarter of a million people. Well, that must mean there's a lot of them that are destined for disappointment. Okay? You can go with that where you want to. Let's move on. Verses 5 through 8. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Asher were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Neph uh, Nephilim, were, uh, or Naphtali actually, uh, were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Zebulon were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. And of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Now, why did the Holy Spirit detail this? Well, first of all, so we understand that He's literal. The 144,000 isn't a symbolic number. There's 12,000 of each of 12 tribes. That's why when the Holy Spirit talks about a seven-year period, and each half is three and a half years, and each half is 42 months, and each half is 1260 days, I don't think those are symbolic. I think they're literal, okay? I don't, I don't know what the Holy Spirit could do to make it more emphatic. We're going to encounter that in chapter, seven, uh, chapter 18. We're going to discover that there are 28 cargoes that are mentioned that are at risk. And I think they're detailed, 28 of them, so you know they're literal cargoes and they're literal people. So anyway, so uh, that's part of this. Now, you, some of you may uh, stumble from time to time because you'll see the name spelled a little differently. You need to realize that, that uh, these names are transliterated. They're approximations of the way the Hebrew is pronounced, and sometimes they don't transliterate quite exactly the same way. Don't let that throw you. But uh, So here are the 12 tribes and the 12 thousands. Now, the 12 tribes... Most of you, just let's, we're going to get into this a little bit because there's some issues here that I want to head off. But let's back up and refresh ourselves from our Genesis commentary. Abraham, of course, married Sarah. And uh, be, before, before Sarah had children, he had a child by, with Hagar by the name of Ishmael. We're not going to go down that path tonight. There's other issues. But from uh, Sarah, uh, he had Isaac. And then Isaac married Rebekah and had Esau. And again, we won't go down that path. And Jacob. Esau and Ishmael intermarry, so no one can track their genealogy clear to either one of them, frankly, but let's not go down that. Let's keep moving here. Uh, Jacob then marries two, Leah and Rachel. He wanted Rachel, got Leah first, and had to go ahead and work another seven years for the one he really wanted. He loved Rachel more than life itself. But under Leah, he has four, his first four children, Reuben, the firstborn, who messes his life up because he messes around with his father's concubine, so he loses his right of firstborn. And uh, Simeon and Levi had other problems. Anyway, Judah ends up becoming the royal line before it's all over. 
Rachel by this time is getting pretty envious and she realizes she's apparently not bearing so she indulges in a procedure that was common in those days and that was to use her handmaid as a surrogate wife. And so her handmaid was Bilhah through whom she has Dan and Naphtali. Leah figures, gee, if that works for her, it could work for me. So she takes her handmaid and has Gad and Asher. By now, Rachel finally has a child, Joseph, her firstborn. Joseph is a prince in the very real ter- There's a, one of the most incredible stories in the, in the book of Genesis from about chapter 34 to the end. It's all about Joseph. Well, by this time, Leah has two more, naturally, herself, Issachar and Zebulun. And then Rachel finally has Benjamin, but dies in childbirth, which makes Benjamin a mixed blessing for Jacob. He loves him because he's his youngest son, and yet he also it was the means by which, um, uh, you know, he lost Rachel. Joseph, of course, goes down to Egypt. You know the story. But down in Egypt, he takes a wife and has two children, Manasseh and Ephraim. And when they finally all get together in the big climax of that story, the father, Jacob, adopts his two grandchildren, Manasseh and Ephraim. So that means you now have 12 tribes, but that's a lie. You got 14 names among those 12 tribes. So you can say you've got a baker's dozen because there are 29 times in the Bible that the 12 tribes are listed. And virtually every list has 12 players, even if you drop one out. Certain ones of those lists don't have Levi because it's a military marching order and the Levi's were exempt from military duty. So take Levi out and you still have 12. Wow, how'd that happen? You'll discover for several different reasons at different times in the list there'll be one omitted and you still have 12. You say, well, how's that? Very simple. And uh, uh, we have Joseph and if you need Manasseh and Ephraim to be counted, you just call it the tribe of Joseph. If you're going to leave one of the others out, then you take Joseph and split him into two, Manasseh and Ephraim, and you still have 12, having dropped the one out. You follow me? Unless you see this, you're just trying to read the Bible yourself, you can get awfully confused, trying to make these things fit. Okay? But I hope that helps. The uh, little complication there, too, Manasseh and Ephraim, uh, uh, Jacob blesses Ephraim above Manasseh, which offends Joseph, but he knew that Ephraim would become a more prominent player. Uh, Manasseh and half the tribe of Gad, excuse me, Gad and, and half the tribe of Manasseh, uh, uh, camp uh, adopt as their land east of the Jordan in the Golan Heights and because uh, they, they thought it was pretty cool and uh, uh, that creates problems for them later. But Ephraim becomes a major, major player in the northern situation which we'll talk about a little bit in a few minutes here. I want to take this opportunity to nail down another myth. That one of the problems you have in Bible studies is not just trying to learn what's going on there but to try to set aside myths and, and uh, pre- prejudices and presumptions that we bring to the study. It's important to set those aside and, and subject them to the test of the Scripture. There is a very popular myth, not just in literature, widespread literature, the so-called Ten Lost Tribes. There are many people that um, study the um, Jewishness of the Scripture that get enamored with the Ten Lost Tribe thing, so much so that it's actually divided fellowships tragically. And uh, there's been some uh, the, the, the tragic uh, overemphasis by majoring on the minors there, but let's, let's, hit this, uh, let's have a pers- biblical perspective of all this. There is no real biblical basis for the so-called ten lost tribes. The epistles of James, 1 Peter, and others are written, are addressed to the twelve tribes in the New Testament. So saying that uh, if ten are lost, is a, it will be certainly news to both James and Peter. There are prophecies of twelve tribes um, in Jacob. Uh, in, uh, next to the last chapter in Genesis, Jacob prophesies over each of his twelve sons, and those little riddles are very enigmatic but very fruitful in terms of understanding the destiny of those twelve sons. Moses does the same thing. The book of Deuteronomy is basically three sermons by Moses before he dies, but in the last one, in Deuteronomy 33, he prophesies over each of the twelve tribes. And those are very instructive. In fact, in some respects, quite astonishing. The myth of the so-called ten lost tribes derives from a misreading of certain passages. People have jumped to certain conclusions and then embellished them. Let's take a look at how the land was divided, first of all. Joshua conducted a seven-year campaign 
that was successful. He dispossessed the land of its usurpers. The succeeding generations did a terrible job at follow-up, and that's a whole other. That book of Judges is a book of dismal failures. But the, when, they, when Joshua uh, finished the conquest of the land, they divided the land by lot, according to the way God set it up. The tribes were allocated by God Himself, by casting lots. Manasseh got that region uh, just east of the Sea of Galilee. Gad, south of him. Manasseh, Gad, and, and uh, 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 Reuben are, are uh, essentially on the east side. Asher's up north, almost in the area of Phoenicia. Uh, Naphtali by the Galilee. Zebulun between those two, a little further to the south. Uh, Issachar, again a little further to the south. The other half tribe, when I say Manasseh, half the tribe took the, had, had chosen to be up in the Golan Heights. And Moses says, no problem, you can have that as long as you join us in the warfare. When we've conquered the land, you can go back and that'll be yours. That was the deal. So half the tribe did that, the other half settled south of Issachar. Then Ephraim has a huge chunk of ground that is um, uh, obviously uh, mid-country on the uh, west side of the Jordan. Dan is a sign between Benjamin and the coast. I'll come back to him. Benjamin is assigned to that area that's basically Jerusalem. Jerusalem's right on the border. It really is in Benjamin rather than in Judah. South of Benjamin is Judah, and south of Judah is Simeon. So these are the twelve tribes. Unfortunately, when Samson dies, Samson didn't accomplish much for the tribe of Dan, but except a lot of pr colorful pranks. But when he dies, they can't handle the area, cannot subdue the Philistines. So they send a party up north to a place called Laish, subdue that town, and they move up north. So the tribe of Dan doesn't stay where he was allocated. He goes up north. And Dan becomes a symbol of the north part of the country. You'll, you'll see uh, uh, in the scripture, it'll speak, say, from Dan to Beersheba, which is way down in the south, as, 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 as in bracketing, if you will, the whole country. And so the Levites now are scattered. They don't get territorial assignments. They get cities, 48 of them. Six of those cities are prescribed as uh, um, cities of refuge. If you were involved in a manslaughter situation, you had to flee to one of those cities of refuge to protect yourself from the avenger of blood. And as long as you stayed in that city, you were safe, and you, that stayed that way until the high priest died. When the high priest down in Jerusalem died, then you're free, and you're, that was their approach to the manslaughter for lots of reasons I won't try to develop here, although there's, all of those have messianic implications. Well, most of you realize that after Solomon dies, there was a civil war. Rehoboam administered the thing rather foolishly, giving Jeroboam his opportunity to split up split away the northern kingdom. So the, there's a civil war, there's a division of the kingdom. Jeroboam rules the northern kingdom from his capital in Samaria from 930 B.C. and following. And uh, Jeroboam's got a problem. If he, he doesn't want his people going down to Jerusalem to worship. So to maintain his political control, he turns them to idolatry, sets up calves, one golden calf in, the land, in Bethel, which is in Ephraim, and uh, the other calf in the, up uh, in Dan. So there's two golden calves, one at the southernmost part of his uh, 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 territory, some of the north. Now right here, I want to caution you, we'll start talking about Ephraim and Dan as geographic regions. Don't assume that the geographic regions and the people of those regions stay fixed. That's where everybody falls into quicksand, so to speak. Um, there is a region called Judah geographic region. There are people that are not of the tribe of Judah going to live there. There's going to be commingling. So you want to be careful to discern the difference between the term, for example, I could say so-and-so is a Californian. I might mean that he's living in California, or he might have come from California. They're two different things, you follow me? And uh, especially here. Anyway, so Jeroboam, to maintain his control, turns the northern king to idolatry. Now, if you were a Levite living in the north and discovered it was politically incorrect to be worshiping Mosaic Judaism, what would you do? Leave. You'd pick up and move south, which is exactly what it says in 2 Chronicles 11, verse 14 through 17. And uh, so they, the, the Levites migrated south. It also mentions that people who were faithful also did that, and I'll show you some of those in a minute. What it doesn't say, but I'm going to infer personally, that if you were in the south 
and you wanted to be an idol worshiper, you went where that's politically correct, right? No use, no use being a, you know, a, a, a Democrat in Republican territory, right? Move, right? Okay. Maybe a bad example, but anyway, go ahead. Now I want you to notice, even before the Assyrian captivity, that's coming later, substantial numbers from the northern tribes had identified themselves with the house of David. In 1 Kings 12 and 2 Chronicles 11 you find that there are people up there under Jeroboam's jurisdiction that still were emotionally and politically and personally committed to David. So they also are going to migrate. Many uh, to, uh, to, uh, to reputed the uh, northern kingdom and, and uh, united with the southern kingdom in a common alliance to the house of David and to worship the Lord. And there's lots of scripture on that you can dig out at your leisure. Now, horrified that Jeroboam set up a rival religion with a golden calf worship at Bethel and Dan, many northerners moved south knowing that the only place acceptable to God was the temple on Mount Moriah. So, if you were, so some people moved south for political reasons, a lot moved south for uh, theological reasons, okay? Those who favored idolatry migrated north to Jerusalem. That's my inference. I think it's hard to re, uh, be hard to uh, re refute that. Now, as, you, as time goes on, you get to Second Chronicles 15. When Asa reigned as king in the south, another great company came from the north. That's recorded in Second Chronicles 59. I'm just going to make the point: there's intermingling of populations going on. Follow me. It's still the northern kingdom. There's still a region called Ephraim and Asher. These are regions. But the people living them are no longer purely of the tribe of Ephraim or whatever. You follow me? They're commingling. Years after the deportation by Assyria. Now, you, you, you know, what happens in the meantime, the, the, let me fill in a little uh, history here. The northern kingdom goes from bad to worse. The southern kingdom also goes downhill, but the, here and there, there are a couple of, good, a couple of exceptional good kings. But it's one dynasty, tribe of David, all the way through the southern kingdom. I forget how many, uh, but uh, one, 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 one um, dynasty. Up north, there's 20 of them. There's murders and struggles for over the several centuries. Um, it's a mess. But God is the northern kingdom goes from bad to worse with very with no real exceptions. The, under Jeroboam, they think they are. Well, in fact, they're materialistically having a great time, very prosperous. People have second homes. His armies did well. And materialistically speaking, the northern kingdom was very successful, but not from God's point of view. And he commissions Hosea from the south to go there and give him his message. And Hosea goes up there and gives him the message that basically because they had abandoned their heritage, their, even though God had provided their abundance and their prosperity, they had abandoned their heritage, their disloyalty to Him is forcing God to vindicate His justice with judgment. And Hosea's message is one of uh, announcing that God is going to use their enemies to wipe them out. And indeed, uh, the, uh, they will be conquered by the Assyrians, the northern group, and uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. But years after the deportation by Assyria, King Hezekiah of Judah issues a call to all of Israel to come worship at Jerusalem and celebrate Passover. In 2 Chronicles 30, his call is to all Israel, not the southern, you know, there aren't ten lost tribes. By the way, let's just stop for a minute. The people who try to say, gee, there's ten lost tribes, they assume that in the south you had Judah and Benjamin. What happened to Simeon? Well, that sort of got absorbed. Well, that's three tribes then, isn't it? Judah, Benjamin, Simeon. And what about the Levites? Well, yeah, they're down there too. Well, if there's tribes lost, there's eight, not ten, because four I can account for, right? See, I mean, it, the whole thing starts to fall apart for a lot of reasons, but um, anyway. Eighty years later, King Josiah of Judah also issues a call. He has a major, major revival going on, uh, and an offering for the temple was received, guess this, from Manasseh and Ephraim and all the remnant of Israel. That's in Second Chronicles 34. See, the point is, in the southern kingdom, there are people from all 12 tribes. There's people probably of all 12 tribes up north. And, and when Assyria comes, they, they get taken as slaves, and it's worse than that. 
See, eventually all 12 tribes are represented in the south. God addresses the 12 tribes in the south. He says, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin. In other words, all of Israel is represented in the regions of Judah and Benjamin. You follow me? You see, you, you need to be, the idea is, when you're studying your Bible, be precise. And the precision here involves understanding geography in, contra in contrast to ethnicity. Okay. The tribe of Judah is sometimes used idiomatically for the southern kingdom. That's what confuses people. When they say the tribe of Judah is an idiom for the bulk of that, it's the house of Judah, what they really mean, which includes members of all tribes. And so when encountering the tribal designations, it's important to distinguish between the territories allocated to the tribes and the people themselves. That's my point. Be sensitive to that. If you're sensitive to that, all this will become very clear. Now finally, of course, the northern kingdom falls. 724, Shalmaneser V besieged Samaria for three years. And uh, King Hosea of Israel attempted to revolt against his paying uh, uh, the Assyrians a tribute money. He had a treaty with Egypt that didn't help many. And uh, finally, Jeroboam's capital, which was Samaria, uh, fell in 722 B.C. Remember, Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom, 722. In 721, in the following year, a year or two, uh, Saragon II seizes power within the Assyrian community. The Assyrians pulled down the towers, took 27,290 captive, and placed Assyrian ruler over the city, and then looted it. And uh, by the way, they have, um, uh, in biblical archaeologists in 1943, they have archaeology that supports all this. They found records of all this, this whole thing. The, the, the 27, uh, 2,700 and 290 captives and 50 royal chariots. But what's interesting is less than 1 20th of the total population was deported. The rest were commingled with captives from other places. And that's, that was the, uh, the, see, the Assyrians had an infamous policy of mixing their conquered peoples. And there, that was their approach to avoiding a revolt. By commingling captives of different ethnic backgrounds, there was less likelihood of camaraderie, and, and, and that, was, that, was their, that was their concept. And uh, was very effective. What this means is, is that the political entity of the northern kingdom is gone forever. There is no more northern kingdom. There are people that may have genealogical links, you know, going back, whatever. But at the same time, this is distinctive from the captivity of the southern kingdom. Babylon is going to conquer the Assyrians, and then Babylon is going to conquer the southern kingdom. But that captivity is different because it is accompanied by a promise from God that they'll return. The Assyrian, the northern kingdom has no promise that they'll return as such, not, not as, a, as a corporate entity. The southern kingdom has a commitment that God will see them come back because of David. God made a promise to David, and it's that promise that ends up as an umbrella, if you will, on the, over the, the, the southern kingdom. So it goes into captivity for 70 years to the day, and then is released by Cyrus, and so on. So... So, see, the Israelite captives by the Assyrians are mixed with Persians and others. The strangers from far off lands are installed in that region. And that's what gives rise to what people call the half Jew. The offspring of that captivity are the Samaritans, because Samaria was the capital. The mixed blood of some Gentile, some Jewish blood commingles. And that's what leads to the advent of what the Jews call the Samaritans, which are some people look at as sort of like they're half-Jews, and they're disdained in the New Testament period. That's why Jesus always picks on a Samaritan to be the hero, to sort of rub their nose in that, I guess. <laughs> um, so we have this quasi-Jewish population called the Samaritans, and John 4, the woman at the well, and all that uh, highlights all of that. Well, the Babylonians ultimately conquer the Assyrian Empire. And uh, so... Uh, the, uh, when, when the northern kingdom went into captivity, all 12 tribes were represented in the south. In 586 B.C., that's when the Babylonians conquer the southern kingdom. They take into captivity members of all 12 tribes as captives. And it's, most scholars assume that the Babylonians commingled their captives. So some of their friends that were of the tribe of Judah, you know, taken in the northern kingdom, very likely married up with the tribe of Judah guys that were captive by Babylon. There's a likely, there's a likely commingling there. So uh, Isaiah, prophesying to Judah, 
refers to them as the house of Jacob, which are called by the name Israel. That's, those are Isaiah's words. See, the other thing I want to guard you against, there are people that say, well, the term Jew refers to the tribe of Judah. The term Jew and Israel, Israelite, and the house of Jacob are synonyms. And I'll show you. Don't, don't fall in the trap of assuming that those are uh, d- uh, distinctives. There's commingled ter- uh, terminology. Even before the death of Rehoboam, God looked upon all as a unity, seeing, quote, all Israel in Judah and Benjamin. He's speaking to the southern kingdom, but he's embracing uh, all of Israel in that nomenclature. After the Babylonian captivity, the, ger- t- the terms Jew and Israelite are used in the Word of God interchangeably. Ezra calls the returning remnant Jews eight times and Israel forty times. There's not distinctives here. They're equivalent terms as far as Ezra is concerned. Ezra also speaks of all of Israel in these passages. And you can go through them and take a look at it sometime. Nehemiah calls them Jews eleven times and Israel twenty-two times. See, Israel can be used denotatively to mean the northern kingdom, but it can also be used connotatively to mean the whole enchilada. Strange, straight, straightforward. Nehemiah speaks of, get this, all Israel being back in the land in Nehemiah 12, verse 47. The remnant that returned from Babylon. By the way, when Cyrus conquers Babylon and, turns and, and gets this letter shown him by Daniel, this letter to him from, uh, in the book of Isaiah, written, calling him by name, he's blown away. And he gives them authority to go home, gives them, makes a donation to the temple, and gives them financial incentives to go home. Less than 50,000 take advantage of it. The rest of them are comfortable. They stay there. Babylon becomes a major Jewish center in the centuries later. Um, the remnant that returned, that less than 50,000, 49,000, forget the number, um, returned to, uh, to the, from Babylon is called by Malachi chapter 1, verse 1, as the nation. As far as God is concerned, they represent the whole nation. In the New Testament, we find the same thing. Our Lord is said to offer Himself to the nation, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Lord doesn't even know that there's ten tribes lost. <laughs> the New Testament speaks of Israel 75 times in 73 verses. And He speaks of Jew 174 times, and they're used interchangeably. There's more, I've seen more propaganda. And by the way, the propaganda that hammers on these things is usually anti-Semitic, which is another clue. Acts 26, verse 7, and the epistle of James is written, he speaks of the 12 tribes. They don't know that there's 10 missing somewhere. Anna, remember Anna? She knew her tribal identity. She was of the tribe of Asher, which is in the north, by the way, and yet she's down there in Jerusalem. Luke chapter 2. Paul knew that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. It's interesting. He, he calls himself a Jew and an Israelite, both. He uses the term in one verse, in one phrase, interchangeably. Don't let people make something of nothing there. And Peter cries, Ye men of Judea, in Acts 2.14. Ye men of Israel, in Acts 2.22. All the house of Israel, in Acts 2.36. Here's Peter in just one chapter, three times using those three terms, obviously as synonyms. Now they are regathered as one. The dry vision uh, 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 thing of Ezekiel 36 and 37 speaks of Judah, which some people call Jews, and Israel, ten tribes, are joined as one at the regathering. And that's happening, that's true today. So the the people who uh, hammer this ten tribe thing are going down a path that's contrary to the Bible and will lead to contrary to biblical conclusions. In and of itself it doesn't look that insidious, but in fact the places it ends up, ends up being anti-Semitic. And by the way, the total physical descendants were not the people to whom the promises were made, and that's emphasized in Romans chapter 9. You can dig that out on your studies. Well, let's get back to the ceiling of 144,000. We ran through those verses there, and we saw these 12 tribes. And one of the first things that strikes even the superficial student is, wait a minute, there's, a, there's at least one missing. Wrong, there's two missing. Where's the tribe of Dan? You see the tribe of Dan there? We got Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Essachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin. But where's the tribe of Dan? It ain't there. Why? A lot of good reasons I'll come to. 
But let me show you something else before we're through. There's another tribe missing. Where is the tribe of Ephraim? It's not there either. Well, it is and it isn't. It's hiding. And I'll show you that in a minute. First of all, why not Dan? Where, why isn't Dan here? Well, first of all, you may recall Jacob in his famous prophecies over all 12 tribes in Genesis 49. When he gets to Dan, he speaks of him as a serpent. And uh, that causes the tribe of Dan to take on a symbol. Ahizer, the head of the tribe of Dan, is not too excited about having a serpent be his tribal standard. So he has a serpent in the mouth of an eagle. That's a little <laughs> more comfortable to him. And that's how the eagle ends up over time becoming the symbol of the tribe of Dan, because the serpent ultimately gets dropped. And uh, as they have their tribal standards, the serpent is, is implied by the eagle, but it, it, uh, that's, anyway, that's the way that goes. Moses says something very strange. It, always, it missed me until relatively recent years. In Moses' prophecy, in Deuteronomy 13, uh, 20, uh, 33, he also prophesies over each of the tribes. And when he gets to Dan, he says, Dan will leap from Bashan. It didn't strike me before because I didn't realize that when Moses' day, that was before Joshua. That was before the land was allocated. And the land was allocated where Dan was down by Benjamin, between Benjamin and the ocean. Couldn't handle it. Dan, of his own accord, goes up north, finds a village called Laish that they take over, and that's where they move to, which is up in the Golan. So indeed, Moses predicts they're going to leap from the Bashan. That's wild. What's that all about? Well, it turns out when you get to Deborah in the, in, in the, the book of Judges, they have this big fight with Sisera, and she's applauding the tribes that help, and she disparages the prize that didn't, and she disparages Dan, who wouldn't even leave his ships because it was cowardice or whatever. Wait a minute, what's Dan doing in ships? And why is he helping? See, he has spun out his interests away from Israel long before the Assyrian invasion. He has spun out on his own long before. He left the allocated territories, and uh, in Judges 5.17, Deborah highlights the fact that he apparently has become a seafaring tribe operating out of the coasts. There's evidences that he, uh, that he uh, populated a portion of it all through Europe. It's interesting that in, the chron in First Chronicles, the first eight chapters are a detailed genealogy of the twelve tribes, and you'll find that Dan is missing. You also discover, it's no surprise, that he's not protected or sealed uh, in the tribulation, which is why we're getting into this here. It's as if, by the way, if you go through the Bible, you'll discover it's almost as if the Holy Spirit has a grudge against Dan from the beginning. All the way through the Scripture, he seems to get the worst of the prophecies, the worst position in the chron you know, chronologies, and so on. He's the tribe through which idolatry entered the land. And that's, of course, detailed in Leviticus 24 and Judges 18 and elsewhere. He was, his tribe was a leader in apostasy under Rehoboam in 1 Kings 12. When, uh, when Jeroboam is, is rebelling against Rehoboam, Dan is part of the apostasy. He's way up north. He's part. In fact, he's one of the sites of the golden calf. Jeroboam puts a, puts a golden calf there. He's also a leader in the apostasy a hundred years later in 2 Kings chapter 10. He's called the voice of calamity in Jeremiah 4 and Amos 8. And he's cursed in Jeremiah 8, 16. Idolaters have their name to be blotted out according to Deuteronomy 29. This is, I, don't want to, I didn't want to take all of these and drag, us, drag you through them this evening, but I thought this one was important enough. Let's take this one. In Deuteronomy 29, starting at verse 18, M Moses says, Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or what? Or tribe, whose heart turneth away this day from the Lord our God, to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall and wormwood. And it come to pass that when he heareth the words of this curse, that he bless himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. The Lord will not spare him. But then the anger of the Lord and His jealousy shall smoke against that man, and all the curses that are written in this book shall lie upon him, and the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. And the Lord shall separate him unto evil out of all the tribes of Israel according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in the book of the law. Now, so Dan's got a plateful, huh? And yet we know from Genesis 49 that he will judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. So he does have a destiny despite all this. 
Dan inherits land in the millennium. So his, de his deficiency is that he will not be protected during the tribulation. But apparently the ones that do survive will inherit, but they'll do it the hard way, if you will. Because he inherits in Ezekiel 48, which describes the allocation of land in the millennium. Well, we have these twelve tribes. I want you to notice something here. One of these tribes is Manasseh, and one of these tribes is Joseph. Well, now wait a minute. Joseph is the sum of Manasseh and Ephraim, right? So if you already have Manasseh, then Joseph minus Manasseh equals Ephraim. Okay? You, you understand what I'm saying? See, in other words, you've got Manasseh in column one. When you get to column two, next to the last, you've got Joseph, but all that's left is what? Ephraim. So Ephraim's there, but undercover, <laughs> sort of. Why? Because Ephraim, in effect, is also omitted in a sense. It's referred, obviously, only elliptically. It was also associated with Jeroboam's idolatry. When he puts a cat, golden calf at Dan, he also puts one at Bethel. That's in Ephraim. In fact, it's at the southern, southernmost border of Ephraim. So the two golden calves bracket the northern kingdom by intent. Well, let's continue with Revelation chapter 7. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with their white robes, and palms in their hands. We've changed subjects here. Verse 9 starts the second half of this chapter. First half dealt with 144,000, of 12,000 reached the 12 tribes. Supernaturally protected evangelists, apparently, because this is the fruit of their ministry. After there gets sealed, we, John now says, he says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number. Wow! Of all nations, not just Jews, all nations, and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. They have the righteousness of Christ. They have palms in their hands. This is a different group than the redeemed we saw represented by the elders. Okay? And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. The twenty-four elders sang a new song. These cry with a loud voice. I don't want to split hairs here, but it's apparently something a little different. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four living creatures, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. Here's a place where we know that the elders are not angels. Why? Because here are all the angels and the elders. They're distinct. And then the four living creatures. Saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Blessing and glory, and wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, power, and might. How many are there? Don't count. How many? Seven. Seven. Good guess. You'll notice in these antiphonal prayers, they always escalate. You start out with four, then a little more, and a little more, until you get to the complete seven. Here's the complete seven. Be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen? Amen. 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 Don't be shy of saying amen. It's scriptural. <laughs> and one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes. And whence came they? And John's getting an oral quiz here. And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. In other words, beats me. <laughs> <laughs> and he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, which have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So these are redeemed, but they're not like the redeemed of the elders. The elders are redeemed up to the rapture. These are redeemed out of the Great Tribulation. How? By the ministry of the 144,000, for starters. There's another two guys we'll run into in chapter 11, but this, this is the... Can you imagine 144,000 Jewish evangelists with the zeal and the knowledge and of all things the Holy Spirit? <laughs> well, the Holy Spirit's taken out of the world at rapture. Yes, in the sense of His containers. The Holy Spirit is very busy during the tribulation. No one's saved but by the Holy Spirit. But not in the sense that we have Him indwelling us today. It's a different, it's more analogous apparently to the Old Testament dispensation. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. Twenty-four elders are ruling as kings and priests on thrones. These guys serve Him day and night. I'm not knocking serving Him day and night in His temple. Don't misunderstand me. 
But I want you to notice there's a difference of, of degree here. between the, everybody, wants to be, everybody wants to be one of the 144,000. Well, welcome to it. I'd rather be one of the 24 elders, or at least be represented by them. You follow what I'm saying? I think. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them, and they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I have an interesting question. I may put it on an exam someday. If there's no hurt, no illness, there's no lack of food, etc., 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 why are they crying about? Why are there tears at all given of the foregoing? I, I think they're, be, they're, they're weeping over lost opportunities. I think they probably are analogous to Schindler at that last scene of the Schindler's List when he realizes his lapel or ring, whatever it was, could have saved one more. Lost opportunities. However successful is always the grief over the one lost. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him. Now, I'm shifting now. I'm going to give you a quick glimpse. We'll take this up when we get to chapter 14, but just to give you just a couple of verses, glimpse. In chapter 14, we have an allusion back to these 144,000. And John says, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, I assume it's the same 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Yes, they're sealed. You follow me? And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. A couple of contrasts here. The tribulation saints, which are the, don't confuse this with 144,000, it's the fruit of the 144,000's efforts. They're not crowned. They have palms in their hands. They're saved out of the tribulation. They stand before thrones and they serve Him day and night. That's the tribulation saints. Those are saved in the tribulation. They were not recognized by John. One of the elders had to explain who they were. So that means he's not, John's not among them. See? The 24 elders are crowned. They have harps, no palms. They're kept out of the tribulation. They sit on thrones rather than stand before them. And they reign as kings and priests. So I just I want to highlight the 24 elders are redeemed the tribulation saints are redeemed, but they're two different groups. That's the main point. Many people get those confused. Well, we have the heptatic structure of Scripture. We went through the seven seal scroll. We now have gone through the little parenthetical uh, chapter before the seventh seal. And chapter eight is going to open up the set with a, the chapter eight verse one is going to introduce the uh, seven trumpets. And as we go through those, we'll discover there's a group of chapters ten through fourteen that will be the parenthetical break, if you will, uh, change of subject, if you will, um, between trumpet six and trumpet seven. When the seventh trumpet introduces four, uh, seven bowls, and there's even a little break between the sixth and seventh of those. That's what we call the heptatic structure, the sevenfold structure. And that's just a glimpse of it. There's far more to it. For your next session, obviously I'd like you to read Revelation chapter 8. Those of you that are ambitious might also want to read uh, chapters, uh, uh, chapter 60 with the seven bowls and see some parallels, but we'll deal with that. The other thing you might do in preparation for next time is you might read the book of Joshua. If you have time, read the whole book because it's relevant to what we're going to talk about, but especially chap the, end of chap the last few verses of chapter 5 and then all of chapter 6, which deals with Jericho. And the seven trumpets, I'm, I, I'm going to suggest, echo what happened in Jericho. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that next time. Um, one of my uh, hypotheses is that the book of Joshua is an architectural anticipation of the book of Revelation. Yehoshua, Joshua, is a variant of Yeshua, or Jesus. He's a military commander dispossessing usurpers in both cases. There's a seven-year campaign against seven of an original ten nations. The Torah is ignored in Jericho. The Sabbath is ignored. The Levites are involved, even though they're not supposed to go to war. 
And uh, Joshua first sends in two witnesses before anything else. Then there are seven trumpet events that we'll talk about next time, which are preceded by silence in heaven for half an hour. I want you to notice how that might be echoed in the Joshua account in chapter 6. The enemies they're facing confederate themselves against the leader in Jerusalem who calls himself Adonai Zedek, the Lord of Righteousness, who is ultimately defeated with hailstones and fire from heaven and signs in the sun and the moon. The long day of Joshua fits in there, chapter 10 and so forth. And of course the kings hide in caves. Rocks fall on us, the same phrase we heard in chapter 6. So not a big deal. If you see it, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. I can't find any commentator that agrees with me, so I'm probably wrong, but I, I tend to see a parallel, and I'll leave it to you whether you see one or not. But tomorrow, next time together we will be exploring seven trumpet events from, the seven, from chapter 8 as we go through that. And uh, chapter 9, oh, by the way, uh, excuse me, chapter, read chapter 9 also. 8 and 9. 8 and 9. And so with that, let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Interesting stuff, but you may notice kind of a change of style once we left chapter 3, well, chapter 2 and 3, of course, which is the most important chapters for you and me. Chapter 4 and 5 are exciting because you're actually in the presence of the throne of God. But from chapter 6 on, you'll have to excuse me if we begin to get a little academic, a little distant, a little less concerned with precision of interpretation because it won't matter to us. <laughs> it's going to be a handbook for those that miss the boat. Um, We need to understand that there is a fallacy that some people indulge. Is that if you don't accept Jesus Christ before the rapture, you've got a second chance after. I won't build the whole case now, but let me just tell you frankly, there are very competent theologians that believe that's a dangerous, dangerous fiction. If you turn down Jesus Christ before the rapture, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, Thessalonians 2 indicates that you will be given over to a delusion and believe the lie. God will, that will be God's way of dealing with this. If you are going to avoid chapter 6 and following, you want to make sure where you are right now. Because whether the rapture comes tomorrow or whether there's some other event that God forbid should take you out of the picture, do you know where you'll be? I hope that you're one of us who is 100% convinced that you will observe the goings-on of chapter 6 and following from the mezzanine. And these things are indeed academic to you. They're a blessing to study for many reasons, but you presumably can feel justify a certain detachment from chapter 6 through 19 because you won't be there. You'll be busy with other events that are also detailed in the Scripture. But the way you do that is to be sure of your position in Jesus Christ. It's not what church you go to. It's not how much of the Bible you may have memorized or any of that kind of stuff. It's all about a personal relationship. And I'm pausing on this a little bit tonight because there's another aspect that I encounter as I travel that we need to also be conscious of. Just because... I believe I can prove to you beyond any reasonable doubt that the church will not experience the Great Tribulation. That does not mean there aren't very dark times on the near horizon for this country. Where do we get the arrogance to presume that we're going to be kept apart from what most of the body of Christ in most of the world for most of the last 1900 years has had to endure, and that's persecution. And there are circumstances on the horizon, dark clouds on the horizon, that imply very dark, troubled times for America on the, on the near horizon. We need to understand, not what they are, you don't have to speculate what they might be, what you need to understand is we may experience an opportunity to be challenged for our loyalty to our king. These people we read about 
in, as martyrs in, 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 the, in those dark times. We may have an opportunity to emulate them. There were people that were willingly burned at the stake rather than put a pinch of incense for Caesar into the fire by the millions. There were more Christians murdered in the 20th century than all the previous years put together. And the economies of scale are still operative. So we need to understand, if you're, you're going to have an opportunity to indicate just how serious you are with Christ. You want to be, get a relationship with Him. You want to fortify yourself to be prepared for whatever opportunities He puts in your path. With that, let's bow our hearts for a word of prayer. Father, we just thank You that You brought us here to this point in time. We thank You that in Your kingdom there are no accidents, that we're all here by Your divine appointment. And Father, we would pray that there be no one in this room that would have any peace until they rest in You. We pray, Father, that Your hand would be firm on each one of us and to draw us ever closer to You, Father. Help us to really grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Help us, Father, through Your Holy Spirit to be more fully committed stewards of these incredible treasures You've put in our, in, in, in before us. We pray, Father, that through your Holy Spirit, you would make each of us more fruitful stewards for your kingdom. We pray, Father, that you would illuminate for each of us specifically what you would have of each of us in the days ahead, that we might be more equipped, more fruitful. Oh, Father, we just commit ourselves into your hands without any reservation whatsoever, in the name of Yeshua, our kinsman redeemer, the root of David, the lamb that was slain, indeed, the lion of Judah, in whose name we do pray. Amen. God bless you.